HubSpot in Southeast Asia and India. And HubSpot is a um, you know software as a service uh, company. And a lot of you guys probably think that you know HubSpot we have a blog and that's why we teach people how to do marketing. Actually, that's like one of our core value proposition, but we don't just uh, do that. We have a market automation platform. But today is not a sales pitch. Today is a uh, session on software as a service um, metrics and how you think about unique economics when it comes to uh, companies like that. So today's session will be a little bit more active and participatory than you would expect. Um, so don't worry about you know asking like dumb questions. I don't think there are any dumb questions. Uh, don't worry about like not knowing anything because that's what we are here for. We are here to learn, and I uh, hope that this is a safe space for everyone to just kind of like contribute what you kind of know, uh, what questions you have, and really I hope that I can get to learn as much from you guys as you can from me because definitely there will be some of you who are like really experienced product managers here. Uh, really experienced sales and marketing folks here that knows a little bit more about maybe acquiring a certain type of customers that I don't know about. Uh, so this session is a kind of brainstorming session as much as a learning session for you to like get to know the world of SaaS and potentially like my objective here is to get you guys excited for SaaS. I think SaaS is a really exciting space to be in and the reason why I think that is so because you consistently get companies in the SaaS world, SaaS uh, kind of like space exiting at a five times price to earning ratio. So for example, if they make like $20, $20 million a year, you can find them like exiting about like $100 million or even like $200 million uh, getting acquired or IPO. So I think it is a very solid business. It helps you, you know, if you think about like Uber and all those unicorns, those are very hard businesses to run because of certain market conditions. And typically what a lot of entrepreneurs do uh, is that if they experience a B2B space, they'll start like a SaaS platform. So hopefully this session will get you guys kind of excited about the world of like B2C and B2B SaaS platform. And hopefully I develop a career in it, either in, sorry, I'm running cold. So either in like product or sales and marketing. So we can start off by maybe discussing a little bit about HubSpot. Uh, I want to like throw you guys back to the year of 2008. Imagine that HubSpot just got started uh, two years after the founding of HubSpot in 2006. Right, so this article gave you a background of what HubSpot has been like facing and what HubSpot's customers are like in the segments of those customers. Um, anyone can give me like a quick show of hands, um, you know, what the two segments are? Anyone knows? Maybe just shout it out. I wasn't hoping that anyone would do that, but anyway, let me do it. So first of all, we have kind of like owner Ollie's, right? And second, we have the Marketing Marys. When you take a look at this two uh, customer segment, quick show of hands, maybe how many of you are in the owner Ollie's segment? You're working in a company that's like owner Ollie's. So you get to, you're in the team of like maybe less than 20 people. You know the founder of the company, the owner of the company pretty well, and you are like pretty close to them. Who's in this company itself right now? Show of hands. Uh, anyone in like a marketing Mary background where you know, there's a bigger corporate, more than 200 employees, you kind of don't know the founder that well, you have like multiple steps of hierarchy to like get to that uh, the space, that, that, that anyone show of hands? Cool. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to do this. Uh, can I get a show of hands as well? Who's a product manager now or expiring product manager? Cool. And who is like a sales and marketing professional? Either you're a salesperson or you're like doing marketing acquisition. Awesome. All right, cool. So owner, owner only account, we define that as like a very small company, uh, employee size of more than, uh, no more than like 20. So we, we say that it's like a small uh, company itself. And Marketing Mary, we have a segment that is like more than 50 employees, right? And when you think about the world of B2B SaaS, you have a couple of ways to really segment out your target audience. And employee size is one of them. 
Anyone wants to give a quick shout out again? Uh, what is another metric that you look at where you evaluate the customer segment of a SaaS company? Again, wasn't hoping that anyone would shout out. Uh, so I'll say that it's industry. You guys, you gotta, you know, participate a little bit more. Man. So we have like industry, um, for example, advertising. Or like automobile is like one one example. Anyone have any idea like other than this two call? Uh, and I'll get to a, to how this relates to the product itself and how this ties back into retention in, in a little bit. So uh, if you think about, I just want to set a little bit of context as to how you manage and think about the different segments of a of a business. So other than employee size and industry, a couple of other key characteristics that we look at include like. A very, very, very important thing that some of you, like sales and marketing folks, will probably know about the budget of a company, right? Mm -hmm. Or the this is kind of like a or a function of their uh, annual revenue because you want to look at whether a company can afford your product or not. So, this is like these are the three main, I'll say source of truth for anyone looking to build a B2B company. Your segments, your customer segments are mainly uh, the three characteristics they look at for any customer segment or this three. Employee size determines how big the company is. You kind of get a sense of how much the company can make. So the budget they have, the advertising budget or any sort of like HR budget, as well as the industry they are in. And these are like the three main characteristics. Um, anyone can tell me what the problem about uh, problem that HubSpot had at the start when we were just founded. Like, what problem did we have in terms of customer segmentation? Quick show of hands. I'm not going to give the answer so easily this time. Anyone knows? Try it. So I'm just repeating your question. I was yeah. trying to understand what is your question. Yeah, the question is what was the problem that we had at the start? in terms of identifying the right kind of customers. We have these two customers, mm. and you want to kind of like serve one of them. And what was the problem in trying to focus and choosing one of them? Do you guys get my question? So again, we have two segments at the start, and with all companies, focus is very important. We want to focus on one single customer. What were some of the challenges what was that confusion and saying that, hey, we should choose one over the other instead of like, say we should choose owner Ollie instead of Martin Mary to like focus on him. Yeah. So it depends on the size uh -huh. of the group. Yeah. Maybe there's more owner Ollie than Martin Mary. Yeah. So we can take a look at certain, I'll, I'll split that out into like two main, uh, give me a second, two main uh, category. Right, we have the external forces, and then we have the internal forces. Market size is one that you just mentioned. How many of them there are? Anyone wants to like, contribute more? Corporate culture. Corporate culture. Corporate culture is an uh, internal. Corporate culture of a, uh, I assume that customer itself. Customer, customer yeah. So your like corporate culture or like hierarchy. That's not right. Okay. Uh, yeah, we are doing things. Anything else? Effectiveness of the inbound marketing. Effectiveness of inbound marketing. Adoption of the philosophy, right? What your company is trying to sell. Adoption of product. And philosophy. Anything else? Yeah. Acquisition cost. Like acquisition cost. Love that. Acquisition cost. Anyone else? It's great. Keep it going. Let's start now. Maintenance cost. So maintenance cost. Yes. Servicing cost. You want to take a look at like how much you acquire those customers for and whether or not you can spend just enough 
to keep them paying at a rate where you're making money for your company. Right? And later on, I'll give you a framework to tie all of these like different factors back in. But this session here right now is really just to like open your mind up to different possibilities, different things to think about uh, at this stage. So we have we had a problem with like marketing Mary and owner Ollie at an early stage of our our founding of the company. So we said that hey, owner Ollie's are easier to like acquire. They cost cheaper um, because owner Ollie's kind of like come from a small company. They get very interested, very excited about new tactics to build up their company. They have a real stake in the game. So once they once you attract them, they tend to like be, be very easily you know, onboarded onto the product itself. Uh, so the acquisition cost for that owner only wins. And then Marketing Mary, you know, not so easy. They're concerned about things that are not just like growing the company, they're concerned about some of their own metrics, like lead generation, things like that. Uh, about impressing their bosses, so they have all these like non-metric uh, sort of operational challenges as well that they need to uh, think about. So acquisition cost for Marketing Mary tends to be a little bit uh, higher. Now servicing cost is flipped. You think about owner Oli when you try to service them as a small business, it can get deceptively cheap to service them because it's easy, right? You get to talk to them, you get to like give them, teach them tactics and teach them how to use your product pretty easily. But the problem is, they have so many things to do. They want to like get their admin sorted right, they want to get their HR sorted right, they want to learn about like how to grow their sales team, they want to grow, grow their marketing team. So it gets deceptively expensive. At the early, in the early days when they just bought the product, it's easy to tell them, hey, use our product and you can grow a company. They'll be like, oh yeah, let's get it on. I'm really excited. But as time goes by, their adoption of the product itself, and we are got to talk about, say, retention here, drops. Simply because they don't have time to think about how to use a product, or actually use a product to grow their company. Marketing Mary, on the other hand, costs a lot to acquire. But as time goes by, they're more targeted in what they want to achieve. If you tell them, hey, by using our product, you can generate this amount of leads, and then you can start impressing your boss because you're hitting all your KPIs. Marketing managers will be like, hell yeah, I'm going to get on, I'm going to like impress my boss because it's important to my job, right? I want to keep my job. So as time goes by, the retention of marketing marriages tend to like outweigh the acquisition costs of like all the uh, of acquiring all the armies. So that's the context that I want to set over here, which is essentially, if you think about the life cycle stage and the lifetime value of all your customers, and you're only thinking about the acquisition cost, you're painting a very, very shallow picture of what your product is about or what your product can go into. And retention is hyper important for any sort of like product manager you would know. To determine like product market fit, you want to get a solid retention value so that they continue to use your product. And if you are if your boss is only telling you that, hey, we should acquire like segment A of a customer because it's cheap to acquire them without looking at how much value or how much money this customer is like bringing you throughout their contract value, you should like get the hell out of the company because he is like not thinking about it in a in a like methodical way. Alright? Cool. So there are a lot of uh, there are a couple of metrics here that that we can talk about. We can talk about non-stop like metrics all day, but in the world of sales, a couple of things are really important. Anyone wants to uh, give a guess what those metrics are? You know, we, uh, we talk about acquisition costs, we talk about retention numbers, we talk about contract value. Any ideas? ROI. ROI is one. But how do you determine ROI of anything? <coughs> Yeah. Your return of investment is a function of like a couple of things. Your revenue. What else? The cost. Anything else? Lifetime value. Love it. Now, this tree. Uh, 
mainly the components, the main components of the of how you calculate the return of investment of anything you do, right? So if you take a look at the revenue, it paints a very shallow picture. In the world of SaaS, where the revenue is paid monthly, if you take a look at only monthly recurring revenue, which is like MRR, it gives you a very shallow picture. Cost of acquisition is like how much you spend in total for marketing for sales to acquire this customer into your product itself. So this is what we call customer acquisition cost. And then lifetime value is a very interesting concept that is only applicable to life, uh, lifetime, sorry, to subscription businesses. Because you're not asking the customer to pay you a lump sum at the start of the contract. You're actually asking them to pay like it's on a subscription basis. So if you think about all your like mobile plans and all that where you pay monthly, they're not just looking at you from a say fifty dollar a month kind of customer point of view. They're actually looking at fifty dollars times twenty four months, and that's the contract value of each like mobile plan you pay for. So that's actually the reason why they're able to give you so much discount on your mobile plan or your mobile when you buy a mobile plan. Because you might be thinking, oh yeah, I'm paying fifty dollars a month, but they're actually giving me two hundred dollars in discount. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, right? But don't fall into that trap because you've got to multiply it by your entire month that you're in with them, which is like twenty four months, and calculate how much you're paying versus that with like the actual discount that you get with like mobile plans. So the subscription business is not a new thing. Um, it has been around for ages, and the software subscription business has really like picked up based on those concepts. So lifetime value is hyper hyper important, right? So these are like the three main components of like calculating calculating return investment. All right, cool. So we will get into the slides now, the boring slides. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. For HubSpot itself, what was the how does the product work and what's the switching cost for your customers? Is it easy for people to just switch around, for like owner Ollie's to? What's you mean like uh, getting out of the product and using a few vendors? Correct, because I imagine as a yeah. service, it's much easier for them to switch because it's yeah. all in their face. Mm -hmm. What was the, the history behind this? Yeah, so switching costs. To begin with. Yeah, switching costs of a product depends on what the usage of the product has been like. For example, in HubSpot, we have five different apps within the single platform. We have a content management system. We have an email system, we have a social media analytics system, things like that. What we found is that anyone who has used the product, like activated on more than three apps, tend to stay a lot longer than someone who has not. And think about it, it makes sense because the value proposition of the platform is to get on board, use all the app, consolidate a marketing strategy versus like a single point solution like MailChimp. So if someone is using HubSpot, just for email, it costs almost nothing to switch out to like MailChimp itself. And in fact, a lot of times, people tend to do that if they don't find value and activate on multiple apps. So the switching costs become really, really high if they have to break up the platform into like multiple, multiple different point solutions. Then you got to build a MailChimp, you got to build a Google Analytics, things like that. So that prohibits someone from switching. And of course, we have a network effect, sort of, in the B2B space where we build a community of HubSpot users who share like best practices or marketing tips, things like that. They can only be executed on the platform itself. So these are like non-product retention strategies that people can use uh, to build a moat, which what we call is like a protective layer around your business. Yeah. So product is one way to like increase retention, but there are also like customer marketing tactics that you can increase retention with. Great questions. Any, any, anyone else? Cool. I'll just go on then. So we have a quite a dry, I'll say, like SaaS metrics. Right? It's, it's hard to get really, really exciting about it. But we have a couple of like metrics that we want to go through today on the agenda. Uh, first of all, if you determine the average selling price of a customer, you kind of know the total contract value of each customer. Second, we'll talk about retention, uh, churn and lifetime value. How do you calculate some of these metrics? Third, we'll talk about like customer acquisition costs, how much, how much it costs for you to acquire a single customer. 
uh, then four we put a couple of metrics together, give you an idea of like the ratio between lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. Last but not least, we'll like put it all together and maybe we open up the floor for like some questions and, and, and think about how do we like make sense of all this different data, different dif different metrics, different data points to paint a good healthy picture of your, your business uh, in SAS. Right, cool. Questions? No one. Okay. So first of all, average selling price, what is it? The average selling price is defined as the total number of deals, the deal value, divided by the deal sizes that you have. For example, again using the Singtel or Starhub mobile plan uh, example, if you're paying $50 a month, and then your, uh, you have like say a thousand, I'm trying to make the math easy to calculate for my end, so I like, try to use whole numbers. Mm -hmm. Say 100 customers, right? And then you have like say another, Fifty customers paying you hundred dollars a month. Do you, can anyone tell me what the like the divider is? Hundred fifty. Yeah. This gives you a health check of what the total. I'm not gonna calculate it because I messed up. Hundred, hundred, fifty. Anyway, so um, this gives you a health check of what your business is like and how much you're able to monetize out of each customer. So average selling price is also sometimes known as annual like contract value, but this is like calculated over the course of a year. So this like this is what people use interchangeably. And sometimes is known as like uh ARPU, average revenue per user. So if you look at if you like come across all these like different jargons and different metrics, it, it means the same thing. It's telling you how much you can make out of each user. Right? So this is pretty important. You must be thinking, what wow, Justin, why are you like telling me every selling price right now when uh, I don't have any idea of how to attract the right customers? We'll get there. Alright? Now if you look at the average revenue or average revenue per user and the average selling price, why is it important for you to know about? It's because there are only a couple of ways you can get to a very, very big business, right? And this is what like venture capitalists tend to call the elephant, the deer, the mouse, and the flies uh, sort of like strategy. So elephants are big enterprises, huge enterprises that are, are very, very hard to acquire. Now, deers are kind of like in between, sorry, let me go to flies first. Flies are like everyday folks like you and me. And typically, MailChimp, um, they have optimized their acquisition strategy to attract a lot of flies. So you can get very, very small value of uh, revenue, but we have a lot of users. Um, supposedly, the holy grail of attracting the right customer for your SaaS business is in the deer space. So deers are kind of like customers who are not very, very big, and they're not small either. And uh, you typically just have to strike a good balance between the size of the company and how much customers you want to like attract into that market itself. So right here, I will introduce kind of another framework that you can think about or like research more into. And this is what we call the market segment of a SaaS business. Typically when you look at the market segment of the SaaS business, you're looking at a pyramid, where it's like divided into three segments. Right here, you have the enterprise. Right here, you have the mid market. And then here, you have the SMEs, or like SMEs, some people call it. And this right here is basically an illustration of this graph where enterprises are like elephants, the mid markets are like deers, 
and then the SME and SMBs are like flies or mouse. And I love this analogy because if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. SMBs are easy to capture, they are like flies, right? But they die pretty easily. So sometimes your business go out of business because they go out of business. That's out of your control. If you go out and like uh, go to Uncle Tan's fruit store and try to like, onboard them to like your software, Uncle Tan may choose to re like retire the next morning, or Uncle Tan may be like down with illness, like be he becomes sick and he closes his business. That uh, those are the kind of like challenges you face when you try to acquire flies, because. When Uncle Tan goes out of business, you can't control it. It's not because your product sucks. It's because you have like identified Uncle Tan as a good customer, and that is the biggest mistake. Now, when you go to elephants, right? Uh, how many of you know the CEO of Singtel? Obviously not. I don't either. So you can't. When you want to sell to enterprises, you're typically selling to like big, big corporations, and you're trying to attract the executive C-suite level of like all these com companies, which is very, very difficult. If you don't have network into that space, uh, it's almost impossible to, to sell into any one of those companies. Now, mid market is where the magic is because a lot of business owners, a lot of like managed marketing managers or different HR managers working in the company itself uh, might not be that close off to talking to you. You might get access to them pretty easily. And uh, the business has gotten traction in the past, like, like say, five to 10 years. They've been making money, so they won't be like Uncle Tan and go out of business the next day. So typically, we call the mid-market deals. Um, but this, I know a lot of venture capitalists will disagree with me, but hopefully none of you are venture capitalists. Um, now, when we look at the SaaS business, there are a couple of important, really, really important metrics as well uh, in with regards to like calculating you know, the, the revenue. Those three are the retention numbers, the churn, as well as lifetime value. Now, magic, right? Retention is one minus churn. Churn is one minus retention. What does it tell you? Basically nothing. Uh, let me explain for that. So, <laughs> retention value is like, for example, you have 100 customers in month one. And retention is at a say, and you always throw a number 10 percent. You have like a month to, if let's say, like retention number is still 10 percent. How much is this? You know what else? Yeah, oh sorry, let, let me give you emails. Total customers. Yeah? Yeah, month two, ten, right? And our churn rate is what? Five percent. If you calculate further, 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 you become like that's like point one customer. I don't think so. So this is how you calculate like churn, retention. Look at the lifetime value of a customer. Now, why is this important? Is because of the next thing. You calculate the lifetime value, the number of months they are in. Anyone ask questions? Oh. You calculate the lifetime value by taking one over the churn rate. So say like point nine. You essentially get the number of months a customer is expected to stay. And uh, I don't know what this number is. But basically it gives you like a, say, the customer will stay with us for 13 months. You know that when you bring on board Uncle Tan or anyone else, they stay with you an average of like 13 months. And because of the nature of subscription business where they're paying you a monthly cost, can anyone tell me why the lifetime value is important? 
Anyone? It's like calculating like the like it helps with the revenue model. Yeah. And then pricing strategy. Exactly. So you kind of get the idea of the total contract value you are having with each customer. So for example, you say you need to fly to Hong Kong to acquire a customer, right? And let's say you are the manager of like a salesperson. The salesperson tells you, hey boss, I need to say like fly over to Hong Kong to stay for a night to spend $500 to acquire a customer which is like paying us monthly $400. Will you say yes or will you say no? Anyone who will say yes? Who will say, go ahead, I'll pay $500 for you to spend a day to acquire this customer who's paying us every month $400. Anyone who will say yes? Who will say no? Mm -hmm. Then what, what the rest of you would? Depends. Yeah, what does it depend on? It depends on the lifetime value of the customer, right? Because if your lifetime value is 13 months and you're just thinking about spending $500 is too much for a customer paying you $400, you're taking a very shallow view of your, your business. You essentially, you need to calculate $400 multiplied by 13 months to determine what's the total contract value of each customer and see wh whether or not this investment is worthwhile for you, right? So lifetime value is hyper, hyper important. Justin, yeah. but how do you determine if this current customer in Hong Kong is falls under the, the label of average? What if he's in the other end? Um, the average. Do you mean like average view size? So that's the based on 100 customers on average in general. Yeah. But um, let's say for example, we also use historical spending that they've done. Yeah. So what other criteria do you use to um, identify if this, whole, this person happens to fall under the, the label of an average user who stays in 13 months? Yeah, so, great question. Can I answer that later on? Oh, sure. like, okay. Yeah, nice. Yeah, okay. Great question. Now, <clears throat> why churn matters is really, really, if, if you don't take a look at the numbers and calculate it beyond the surface level, it can give you a very difficult Okay, five minutes. You can give you can give you a very very difficult picture of uh, the health of your company. Say you have uh, a churn rate between one to six percent, right? Why is one to six percent such a big jump? Yeah, does anyone spot a trend in this graph or this table itself? Yeah. So if you think about churn rate. If you're losing five customers more than you are now, the money you're making essentially is an exponential function. If you lose five customers out of your 100 customer base instead of just one customer, the difference is like almost $83,000. Um, this exercise gives you a good reason as to why retention is that important, right? Any small fluctuation in the churn numbers will wreck your financials and wreck the health of your business or your product into like you you'll be worth fuck all basically. Right? So once you know about the amount of money you're getting from your customer, the next step is to take a look at how much you're spending to acquire those customers. And the CAC is usually calculated by cost of sales and marketing spend divided by number of customers. Yeah, pretty simple, right? But, can anyone tell me what's the problem with that? Anyone? Just taking an overview of like, why uh, average CAC is a very, very shallow metric to look at. You don't take consideration about operations? Um, operation cost is kind of like classified under servicing cost or uh, retaining the customer. Anyone? That, that's, a, that's a good try. Anyone wants to uh, give it another try? It differs by whether they're owners, ollies, or yep. marketing areas. You should take a look at the customer acquisition cost across different customer segments. Because the lifetime value of each customer is different, and you're just taking a very, very shallow view of like how much it takes to acquire all customers, you will not calculate your metrics properly. 
So these are the ways that you can calculate CAC across different customer segments. Um, first of all, it all boils down to defining who you're trying to target. And you want to allocate like marketing expenses to each segment and allocate sales expenses to each segment. It's not rocket science, it's like a recipe basically. Um, now, you want to combine those two to together, the lifetime value and the customer acquisition cost, and give yourself a good idea of what the return of the investment of customer acquisition is all about. Right? This there's another exercise that perhaps I want to do with you before we end off. Uh, let's say you have hundred thousand dollars to spend on sales and marketing, and you can attract say hundred customer A and twenty five customer B. Uh, which one is more worthwhile investment? Do you want to attract hundred customer A or do you want to attract twenty five customer B? And of course, the answer is like it depends. It depends on what the lifetime value of each customer is. Uh, and once you are able to do that, you can basically calculate a very good picture of what your ROI is like across the different channels, across the different uh, customer segment. Right? Is the ROI only KPI to say whether you did a good deal or not? The KPI, uh, uh, ROI. Yeah. The only indicator to say whether you choose 25B or 100A. Or there are other indicators? Um, it depends. If you are taking a look at the product usage, that also matters as well. Like, I would say product usage is contributes to the lifetime value of a customer. Mm -hmm. So the ROI, when you calculate it, it looks simple, but there are different components to it. When you take a look at retention numbers, there are two strategies perhaps you can go for broadly. Uh, within the product itself, does it solve the customer's problem? And second one is customer marketing, customer sales. Can you are you able to upsell that customer better? Are you able to retain that customer better through marketing strategies, through engagement with them? So those spend will need to be taken into account when you calculate ROI as well. Okay. So this is a very simple overview. I'll be happy to talk about more ways we can calculate ROI. So uh, just putting everything together. We have a framework that, uh, if any one of you heard of the R metrics for, star metrics for pirates, is basically acquisition, how many customers, how many potential leads you can get into the system, the activation of those leads, when someone becomes a lead uh, into a user, uh, the retention of those customers or those users, every month, are they staying with your product, are they using your product, and then finally is the uh, revenue that you can get out of each customer. Once they start using a product, you, ideally you want to start making money. How much money can you make out of each user? So today's uh, session actually focuses a lot about focuses a lot on the retention and revenue figures. There are different metrics you need to track for acquisition and activation as well, which I'll be happy to share about uh, if you guys want to know. But very quickly, tying everything back together, customers in different segments, uh, they give you different value. You want to calculate the ROI of each different segment. Retention is very, very important. It not only helps your business survive, it's a sign of product market fit uh, for your product. And last but not least, I hate to be that guy, but everything depends on the situation. Uh, what focus you should have on what metric depends on the growth stage of your company. So if you come out and ask me like, for your business, uh, what metric you should focus on? I'll give you the most hated answer of all time. It depends. Uh, so uh, you know your business more than I do. I'm just here to provide you a framework to evaluate some of those stuff. Right? Cool. Thank you guys. Thanks, Justin. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, if you have questions, sorry we have to cut it a bit short, so you can approach him anytime after. Uh, our next talk here will be uh, Vian Ia Tech Marketing uh, in about five minutes. So. Uh,